Across the vast expanse of our galaxy, the Imperium has seized control of a million worlds, each of which are held within the vice grip of the careless High Lords. It would be foolish to consider the detached nobles as being anything other than a corrupted figurehead to the various failings of a dying empire. But thankfully, it is from the valiant armies of mankind which have kept our humble world safe from the most horrific of disasters which have endlessly plagued our species. Despite all their best efforts, however, they have failed time and time again to fend off our countless enemies who are eagerly watching and waiting for any sign of weakness before they finally strike. Many of the aliens, mutants and heretics which we have encountered within the abyssal depths of space have been relatively recent arrivals on the galactic scene. The fallen legions of chaos have only risen to prominence since the days of the Horus heresy. The Tyranids have only probed our stars within the last few millennia, and the Tau are practically infants, foolishly thinking that they have a place within the cosmos. But none of these factions can hold a candle to the venerable metallic armies who have slumbered away the long years as a relic from a bygone age. I am, of course, referring to the undying legions of the Necrons. Over 60 million years ago, when the earliest ancestors of man were naught but scampering quadrupedal beasts, the cold and toneless Necrons descended into their tomb worlds, with the intent on waiting out the long years until their time to emerge and dominate once again occurred. Rather unfortunately, as time marched ever forward, Many of the younger species of the galaxy proceeded to colonize these worlds, ignorant to the threat which slept beneath their feet. With this in mind, the story which we are to investigate today is one which takes place upon a tomb world which humanity erroneously conquered, and it would be known as Damnos. I have already laid out the events which transpired upon this damned world. However, I shall quickly recount them for you before we begin. The frigid planet was lost during the latter years of the 41st millennium, as the ancient Necrons had been disturbed by a curious Mechanicus exploratory force, ultimately leading to the reawakening of their tomb world. Their endless phalanxes swept across Damnos, driving any survivors back to the capital hive city of Kellenport. Hope arrived for the squalid defenders in the form of the decorated second company of the Ultramarines. However, even these veterans were unable to face off against the planet's true rulers. Captain Cato Sicarius was mortally wounded. The heroic dreadnought Agrippan was destroyed and the company was left in truly dire straits from the levels of death sustained by their forces. Nevertheless, the Astartes never forget their enemies, and the scars of defeat are ones which can only be redeemed in fire. Today, we are to explore the Ultramarine's vengeful return to Damnos, where they sought to avenge their fallen brothers and to once again reclaim the world for the glory of the Imperium. Since the days of the Great Crusade, Damnos had been a bustling hub of activity. Industrial zones chugged away, burning so intently that the thick layers of ice surrounding the foundries melted down to reveal the cracked ground beneath. Millions of the Damnosians called the great hive cities as their homes with their daily toil elevating the frozen world into a productive and exemplary symbol of our defiance against even the harshest of planetary conditions. But this has all since changed. The world has fallen silent, with only the eerie hum of arcane Xeno technologies echoing out across the frozen wastes. The ruined remnants of cities, settlements, and hab facilities jut out from the ice which has since reclaimed their barren foundations. 
the great geothermal fusion stations of Mando's Prime, having been left unactive for so long, became locked within the ever-growing layers of permafrost, likely damaging them beyond all hopes of repair. Life no longer exists within the frost, and so the bitter elements have once more encased the hive streets within a thick layer of ice, forever preserving the remains of the heroes who gave their lives to the world's failed defense. If one were to brush away the snow and peer down into the ice, they may spot a blue pauldron belonging to an Astartes who was prepared to die before letting this world fall to an army of Xenos. And yet, no Imperials will be found on Damnos. Instead, the skeletal and mechanical legions of the Necrons once more rule over their world. Endless phalanxes of warriors still march between the tomb complexes, being stationed by their noble lords to bolster the key strategic locations of their old home. The skies are dotted by fleets of skimming crafts, sent out to perform reconnaissance missions, keeping an ever-watchful gaze on the world. Small mounds of snow would occasionally burst open in a spray as burrowing canoptech spiders emerged from deep underground, only to silently glide away, ready to plunge once more into the ice, presumably to help repair and activate further aspects of the deep tomb complex. The skyline of Damnos is no longer occluded by imperial structures alone. Instead, the ruins have been overshadowed by the great sprawl of Necron infrastructure. Colossal pyramids rose from the depths of the Tyrian Ocean, arranging themselves into an ominous grid hovering far above the icy surface. Immense energy pylons have slowly grown from every crack and crevice of the planet, with their purpose being almost completely unknown to all but the Necrons themselves. But their ominous glow is the only sign of their truly nefarious purpose. Come nightfall, Damnos is illuminated by the sporadic bursts of emerald energy which will spurt and arc out from the various structures catching on the crystalline ice mounds of the surrounding landscape. Strange obelisks pulse with blinding lights, perhaps signaling that new aspects of the deeply buried tomb have been reactivated and that the ancient crypts are once more able to bring their most cataclysmic of instruments up onto the world's surface. These Shining beacons would briefly reveal strange floating cubes of a starkly black material, eerily hovering within the skies in a foreboding lattice. Truly, to investigate this world would be the dream of many a Mechanicus agent. However, the time of mankind had long since come to a close upon this blasted world. Instead, it was the Necron Lord, known as the Undying, who now claimed the icy crown of Damnos. He had been assigned as the ruler of this core world back in the heyday of their ancient empire, and this title would not be taken from him by a race of ignorant upstarts. During the final days of the Siege of Kellenport, his terrible image was projected into the skies above the city, leering down at the petrified and helpless defenders. Furthermore, his own words echoed out across the planet, foretelling all that their mortal lives were at an end, and that doom would soon befall any who had laid claim to his world. Though the futile defenders had claimed to see this lord having been crushed to death by the heroic charge of the dreadnought Agrippan, little did they know that the blinding light which burst forth from his frame was not a sign of his demise. Instead, the Undying had simply phased out of existence with an immense flash, reappearing once more within the deep command crypt of his tomb, where his sublime body of Necrodermis was repaired, and he could once again stand as the supreme overlord for all of Damnos. With the frigid planet being once again held within the necrodermis palm of its old master, let us now turn to the ultramarines, who were still in the process of recuperating from their immense losses. 
Around half of the second company had died within the ice fields and city streets. 500 of the Emperor's own angels lay dead, having been disintegrated by the roaring beams of Gauss fire unleashed upon them. Countless tanks and sacred pieces of equipment were similarly lost, seemingly with no chance of ever being recovered from the snow. All of this death and all this loss, simply to save the lives of a few thousand terrified citizens. There were not even enough survivors to populate a single hab block of a hive city, and yet the ultramarines had given everything to extract them from the hellish war zone of Damnos. Some may say that their struggle was worthwhile, and that losses such as these should be expected. For what purpose do the Astartes hold if not to protect and save the meek inhabitants of the galaxy? There was one marine, however, who did not share in this opinion. The captain of the fated second company, Knight Champion of Macraig, and High Suzerain of Ultramar, Cato Sicarius, had left Damnos as a changed man. He had been pushed to the brink of death during his duel with the Undying Lord, who had impaled the captain with a gruesome swing of his war scythe. Though he was successfully extracted by his brother Marines, the bitter sting of failure weighed heavy on his soul. As he recovered his health within the confines of an apothecarium, the realization that he had suffered his first true defeat became an overwhelming and unavoidable pain. His career had been defined by victory after victory, with the deeds of the second company having been risen to the status of illustrious legend, all thanks to his keen tactical judgment. So vast was the tapestry of his accomplishments that most believed that he would be the sure successor to their chapter master, Marnaeus Calgar. And yet, Damnos had still proved to be too great of an obstacle for him to overcome. His once tempered and calculated mind had become racked with feelings of inadequacy and failure. Every waking moment was split between long periods of isolated lamentation and fierce training actions, performed with the hopes that it could bring him some semblance of peace for the actions which had transpired. Yet, he did not seek acceptance. Instead, he was fixated upon revenge. The fall of Damnos had not been kept as a secret to the Ultramarines, and word of their failings had spread far and wide throughout the Imperium. This world was not the only one to have been reclaimed by the ancient Necrons, as this phenomena was occurring all across the galaxy with hundreds of tomb worlds reactivating and new legions of Necrons emerging from their buried vaults. That being said, many of these fallen planets were simple colonies which had but a meager planetary defense force to shield them. Damnos was rather unique in that the armies of the Necrons were able to utterly decimate one of the most highly regarded of space marine companies with seemingly no significant effort. As much as the Inquisition and the Administratum tried, word of this decisive defeat became known to all. How could the citizens of the Imperium feel safe if even the Emperor's angels could not protect them? How could any be sure that their own world was not a tomb world? And who could possibly save them given this record of failure? Such was the level of public dismay and disorder over this defeat that even the High Lords of Terror were made aware, being forced to take action against the tremendous loss. They decreed that the collective loss of morale was far greater than the loss of Damnos itself, and that a quick rectification was needed to once again restore the faith of the citizens of the Imperium. With this, the Ultramarines were soon tasked with a most personal mission to them. They were to return to Damnos, exterminate any remaining Necron forces, and reclaim the world for the glory of the Imperium. It was years after the fall of Damnos that the call for war came to Ultramar. Several strike teams of the Death Watch were dispatched by the Ordo Xenos 
to inform the Astartes of their new mission. The selected groups were widely known within the organization as being perhaps the finest of anti-Necron specialists within the Imperium, and so there were none more suited to carry out this retributive task. It was rather unusual for such a large deployment of the Death Watch to be sent onto an Astartes world, and so the system was abuzz with rumors as to the nature of their visit. Some hushed whispers within the Hive Cities even suggested that the system of Ultramar contained several tomb worlds and that damnation had come to the Ultramarines. Yet this was pure speculative heresy, and any who spread this salacious rumor were quickly rounded up and silenced. The true reasoning behind their visit quickly became apparent as the presiding watch captain, known as Lazarius, met with Marneus Calgar upon the world of Hera to discuss their coming mission. The two exchanged haggard pleasantries. Before Lazarius laid out the Terran instructions for the Ultramarines to retake Damnos by any means necessary, Calgar was not unfamiliar with the story of its downfall. Though he had not been present for the battle, he had studied the disastrous reports from Sicarius, and so the thought of his sons returning to this doomed world seemed to be a fool's errand. He knew that the Second Company only faced off against the vanguard of the Necrons, and that should they return to the icy battleground, that they would need to contend with a fully awakened tomb world this time, an obstacle which he saw as being nearly insurmountable. Yet, self-doubt is not a trait found within the esteemed leadership of the Astartes. The shame of suffering defeat upon Damnos was great, yet the knowledge that hundreds of his brothers had died within the frigid streets of Kellenport was one which could not be ignored, both as a mission to redeem the Ultramarines in the eyes of the Imperium, as well as to avenge their fallen comrades. Calgar slowly accepted that his chapter would once again need to land upon the frigid world. The Ultramarines had a duty to the Imperium and a duty to themselves. They would amass their chapter once more, combining the forces of every available company to scour the world of Damnus from the presence of the Necrons and to prove that none may stand against the warriors of Ultramar. Though many years had passed since their first incursion, the second company had not yet recovered from their cataclysmic defeat. They had garnered many more victories since that day, and yet several of their squads still held empty positions, with few recruits having been found to display the needed valiant tenacity to join with this legendary force. As previously mentioned, their captain, Cato Sicarius, was also still locked in a forlorn state of loss for his failings. However, there were none more prepared for a second war on Damnos than of the captain himself. He had longed for an opportunity to redeem himself, and so he readily pledged his men to this cause, finally feeling the rush of martial anticipation for the first time in years. It was not just a redemptive warpath which he intended on bringing back to Damnos, a close friend of the captain, Death Watch Sergeant Davian Imocles, had entrusted him with a vortex grenade, an ancient artifact which could rip open a void in reality, pulling everything around it into the nightmarish realm of the warp. The captain solemnly accepted the gift, unsure of when he would use it, but confident that it would aid him in his goals. Though he may have initially felt that the saved refugees were nothing but a symbol of his own failings, in the recent years he had somewhat changed his opinion on this. Many of the Damnosians had been relocated to the Agri world of Tarentus, within the realm of Ultramar, and some of them had proven themselves to be capable enough to endure the process of becoming a space marine. As such, some of those recovered from the doomed world now stood as scouts within the Tenth Company, where their tenacity and determination at liberating their old home world was nothing short of inspirational. Many more were recruited into the Imperial Guard, who would accompany the Ultramarines on their expedition and hopefully prove their worth to the Emperor. 
The Marines, however, had organized themselves into a truly prodigious force. Around half of the entire chapter assembled within a great fleet, with Marnius Calga himself leading them from the vanguard. It had been many years since such a great assembly of ultramarines had been present together, but each and every one of them were prepared to fight and die to restore some semblance of honor within their ranks. Being fully aware of the great artillery pylons which had destroyed the venerable strike cruiser known as the Nobilis during the First Battle of Damnos, Calgar did not wish to place his fleet directly in orbit, where they may be brought low by the salvos of Gauss fire. As such, he directed his fleet to emerge from warp travel in the shadow of the great gas giant known as Utinos, where it would be hidden from the sensors of the Necron forces. He then ordered for his flagship to fire their weapon batteries into the asteroid fields of Utinos, causing a small shower of the rocks to simply sail out of orbit, where they would inconspicuously drift past Damnos as a strange shower. These asteroids would act as a shield to the fleets of Ultramar, who travelled in their wake, kept completely shrouded from detection by the mechanoids of Damnos. Though the Cryptex did indeed notice this asteroid shower, they accounted it as nothing but an ordinary celestial phenomena, and so returned to their arcane workings within the tomb world. Thanks to this, the Ultramarines were able to bring their fleets close enough to Damnos that they could launch their violent assault with very little initial resistance. Hundreds of drop pods were jettisoned from the strike cruisers, whilst heavy ordnance pounded the planet's surface, intent on bringing any located Goss pylons to ruin before they would have a chance to fire back. Meanwhile, interceptors, fighter crafts, and Thunderhawk gunships were launched en masse, darting and careening down through the clouds to initiate huge bombing runs or to engage with the various Necron skimmers which patrolled the upper atmosphere. Unfortunately, however, whilst the Necrons may move rather slowly in their metallic frames, their logic systems are far faster than any human could truly comprehend. The huge energy pylons detected the invasion as soon as it was launched, resulting in the defensive weapon batteries bringing themselves back online almost instantly. They had retained the tracking and analytics data from the first invasion all those years back, and so they were finely calibrated on the ultramarine movements, resulting in them shooting down dozens of drop pods and hundreds more of the small attack craft. Furthermore, the Necrons had quickly ordered for the bulk of their ground forces to converge towards the location of this attack, with the expectation that they could exterminate the Astartes' vanguard in one fell swoop. This, however, was all planned by Kalgar. This initial wave was nothing but a distraction force to draw the Necrons away from the true invasion site. The first drop pods were of the Deathstorm variety, containing automatic weaponry and rocketry, all to devastate the legions of Necrons, which would soon advance into their sensor range. The real assault wave carrying true Astartes within their pods was aimed at a region just to the south of Kellenport, and thanks to this distraction, they could land relatively unscathed from the blasts of Gauss pylon fire. Squads of Marines quickly assembled into cohesive units before advancing through the snowfields to reclaim Imperial territories from the Necrons. Terminator squads from the venerated First Company teleported down amidst their enemies, crushing mechanoid skulls with their crackling power fists. Heavy Thunderhawk gunships came down from orbit, carrying land raiders, predators and vindicators all of which were quick to levy their armaments into the Necron defensive structures. Meanwhile, the veterans of the Death Watch were deployed far deeper into enemy lines, where they were to locate key entrances to the tomb complex and destroy them with potent melter charges, hopefully crippling the Necron capacity to effectively respond to this attack. Whilst the initial invasion force was astoundingly rapid, 
the Necrons were not ready to lose this world once more. The ice buckled and cracked as great monoliths rose from beneath the surface, rising high into the air before drifting towards the Imperial lines. The phalanxes of warriors had also been redirected from the initial distraction wave towards the primary marine force, where they slowly and methodically marched through the thick snow, intent on exterminating the insolent mortals before them. Doomsday arcs arranged themselves into formation and tore their way across the planet, homing in on the ultramarine heavy armor, with their cannons being more than potent enough to reduce even a mighty land raider to naught but stray atoms. Nevertheless, by this point the ultramarines had assembled their entire army upon the surface of Damnos, with hundreds of marines and tens of thousands of guardsmen standing ready to advance through the snow to take back their world. The complex command protocols of the Necron forces quickly determined that the threat posed to them was great enough that they required some of their more powerful assets to assure them victory. As such, a signal was dispersed across the world causing many more of the tombs, ancient weapons to activate once more, humming into existence as sparks of emerald energy flowed back into their archaic power coils. As an incredibly ominous sight, the hovering black cubes which had dotted the sky soon began to glow, before rapidly assembling themselves into the frame of a truly immense diamond-shaped structure. This floating monstrosity vibrated with such ferocity that it seemed the air itself was being ripped apart around it before it finally groaned as it opened itself up, revealing a blazing humanoid creature trapped within it. This being appeared to be formed from pure lightning as it screeched and writhed almost as if it was trapped within a malign Necron prison. Before the Marines even had time to contemplate the nature of this being, it unleashed hundreds of arcs of viridian lightning into the Imperial lines, wiping out entire squads with every blast of its terrible energies. This was responded to with the beams of LAS cannons and whirlwind missile batteries, but these seemed rather inept at piercing the ancient pyramid. Whilst the actual creature was simply blinding to look at, there was another which strode beneath the ancient structure, and it was he who took the notice of Kalgar. The High Lord known as the Undying had returned to lead his armies. The Ultramarines were shocked. Legends of the first Battle of Damnos told of how the dreadnought Agrippan had destroyed the antediluvian noble, and yet it seemed that this was not how the events of that day transpired. Rather than being killed, he had teleported his body away from the battle, bringing him back to safety whilst keeping up an illusion of death to the Imperial forces. Seeing not only the dreadful pyramidal weapon as well as the undying Lord, Kalga was prompted to call for a targeted orbital bombardment against his new foe. The heavy armaments were fired, and yet these crude weapons were seemingly useless against the technologies of the Necrons. As the smoke cleared, the Lord still stood, and the great Tesseract Vault was unscathed, with its lightning blasts singeing away the air as it continued to fire into the Imperials. As the battle raged on, Chief Librarian Tigurius desperately sought to understand and decipher the energies coming off of the Necron structure. Straining his mind, he projected a version of himself through the warp, in an attempt to connect with the being held within the vast prison. It did not take long until the librarian was forced back from this attempt, however. The ephemeral being which he uncovered within the vault was not a simple source of power. It was a god. The Necrons had wrangled control of a Catan shard, only to repurpose it into a weapon of terrible destruction. Not only was it fueling the arcs of Gauss fire, but it was also projecting a shield over the rest of the Necron army, and so it quickly became apparent that its destruction was of the highest priority to the Ultramarines. 
One of the most challenging aspects of combating the Necron menace is that when a warrior is supposedly killed in battle, that they will often simply reconstruct themselves and stand back up, ready to fight once more. This is thanks to their living metal frames, which can rapidly repair itself from even the most catastrophic of damage. Because of this, the Marines were instructed to utterly destroy any Necron corpses they came across during their battle. Whilst advancing, tactical squads would rain bolt of fire and crack grenades down into the broken remains of the mechanoid warriors simply to ensure that they were utterly destroyed and that there would be no chance of them being resurrected once more. To walk upon the ice of Damnos was to teeter on the brink of death. Arcs of Gauss fire strobed through the air, reducing even the heavy armor of a Terminator down to its constituent atoms. Meanwhile, packs of flayed ones, sensitive to the scent of hot blood and fallen viscera, were clawing their way out from under the permafrost itself, dragging marines and guardsmen down into the ice where they would be ripped apart and voraciously feasted upon. Destroyers, enraged at the sight of the living, skimmed across the frozen wastes, unleashing the combined blasts from their gauss cannons into any whose existence proved to be too insulting to them. As the conflict continued, the very ice was beginning to melt from the sheer levels of energy unleashed by both sides, morphing the environment into a frigid, waterlogged battlefield. All around, plumes of thick smoke billowed out from the ruins of tanks and energy beacons, coalescing into dark, occlusive clouds within the sky above. The battle was not only waged at a distance, as many of the Imperial forces dove headfirst into the front lines to engage themselves in the glorious art of melee combat. Necrons were cleaved in twain, by the vicious slices of power swords wielded by the vanguard veterans of the First Company. The Marines were not entirely unmatched, however, as they soon found themselves face to face with the scuttling horrors known as Scorpec Destroyers, who desperately sought out the slaughter of any foolish life form who found themselves upon their world. Principally amongst those involved in the chaotic swirl of close quarters combat was the High Suzerain himself, Cato Sicarius. There once was a time where the captain was an exemplar of swordsmanship whose own finesse in melee was truly awe-inspiring. All had heard the tales of his courageous charges and valiant displays of heroism. However, here upon the melting snow of Damnus, he seemed to fight as a different man. His followers saw him lunge recklessly into combat for no strategic ploy other than to surround himself with danger. Some were even bewildered by his orders to charge deeper and deeper into the Necron lines, placing his marines in dire situations seemingly just to stoke his own ego and to prove to himself that the constructs could not bring him to failure again. With the intensity of their conflict rising, it soon became clear that neither side could gain a real advantage over the other. Kalgar, a veteran leader, having stood as the head of the Ultramarines for several hundred years, was second to none in the matter of military strategy, and yet he struggled to locate any weaknesses which could be easily exploited. The rapid computing power of the Necron Command protocols was able to respond and double down upon the Imperial actions, leaving both sides locked in place, unable to wrangle control of the battlefield from the other. Even though Kalgar was one of the most learned followers of the Codex Astartes, its teachings were somewhat unhelpful during this scenario. His every tactical ploy was parried, any flanking maneuver was met by a prowling ambush, and even the weaponry of his armies was found to be lacking against a foe, which could effortlessly rebuild and reform itself if it was hit. Slowly it became clear that the tactics of the Ultramarines were proving to be their own undoing. 
The Necrons had analyzed every single scrap of data recorded from the first Battle of Damnos, deciphered their strategic methods, and predicted the entire plan of the second invasion down to the composition of their tactical squads. With this chilling realization, Kalgar was forced to forego the sacred doctrines which had aided the Ultramarines since the days of Gilliman, and instead, he formulated a new plan. He had seen a group of scouts made up of native Damnosians rescued from the First War detonate a cache of melter bombs at the base of a great pylon. Whilst this did not destroy the artillery piece, it did result in the overloading of its power core, leading to an immense burst of energy to prematurely fire out from its primary crystal. This blinding Viridian bolt only blasted out for a single instant before it seemingly shorted out, leaving the pylon unable to fire more arcs. Filled with a resolute mix of inspiration and desperation, Kalgar summoned his honor guard and charged towards a still functional pylon. He clambered his way up onto the metallic structure before grabbing onto the crescent-shaped frame with both hands. As his gauntlets of Ultramar activated, he groaned and began to twist the great pylon at its base, all to aim its mighty cannon directly at the floating pyramid above him. The hulking mass of ancient metals was forced to point directly at the heart of the Tesseract Vault, and with a great strike of his fists, the pylon's power core overloaded, unleashing an immense pulse of energy into the creature tethered within its esoteric prison. Legends say that the burst of emerald light unleashed from this blast briefly outshone the star of Damnos itself, and that even those aboard the strike cruisers in orbit were forced to shield their eyes from its flash. Those closer to the explosion did not emerge so unscathed, however. Several squads close to the Tesseract vault were vaporized, with only a deathly shadow of their final pose being scarred into the ground below them. Many more were grossly injured. The Marines, held within their sacred power armor, were fortunate enough to be shielded from the energy pulse. But many of the meager guardsmen were blasted back with their bones being utterly shattered and their eyes having been burnt down to their sockets from the blinding flash. As the light dimmed and the Marines once again regained their senses, they found themselves back in the Battle of Damnos and yet, there was one notable change. The great Tesseract Vault had been destroyed, with its four corners laying as cragged remains on the snow before them. The central being, however, remained almost completely intact. Kalga may have been successful in destroying the ancient prison, but in the process of his ploy, he had done the unthinkable and freed a shard of a transcendent Catan. The once tethered deity rose high into the air, blazing and arcing with lightning, as if it was made purely from the pulsating energies of the Necrons. Looming over the battlefield, it unleashed its first roar since the times of the war in heaven, echoing out across the planet, knocking back the Imperials and Necrons alike. His tenor rose until the icy landscape around him seemed to buckle and crack beneath the weight of his terrible bellowing. Even with the sonic dampening features of the Astartes' helms, they too were deafened by the divine howling which battered its way through their bones. As the screech rose ever more, it finally caused Damnus itself to break. A vast chasm opened up, with the landscapes being ripped asunder from the sheer cacophonous wails of this monstrous being. Hundreds of Necrons and dozens of Marines fell to their deaths, being consumed within the depths of this blasted and damned world. Tigurius, now able to properly form a psionic connection with this being, learnt of its name and of its nightmarish reputation. This was a shard of Igrania, the molder of worlds. In the bygone days of the Necrontier, when the Catan still ruled as the star gods of reality, this being was infamous for being able to break down a world 
into nothing but a field of rock and stone before reforming it into an arrangement which was more pleasing to the stellar deity. With the Catan now free, it paused, its roaring, and inhaled deeply, savoring the frigid taste of freedom from the upstart Necrons. With a silent sweep, the being turned and stared down at the Ochroid frame of the Undying Lord. It was the ancient ruler of Damnos who had corralled and exploited the imprisoned star god for an eternity, and it now seemed that the opportunity for revenge had finally presented itself. The very ground beneath the Necron Lord crumbled and reformed itself into the shape of a gigantic clawed hand which closed itself into a fist, intent on crushing the Golden Lord into nothing but a hulk of broken scrap. Unfortunately, however, it seemed that once more the Undying Lord would live up to his name, and with a bright flash, the Necron phased out of reality, teleporting himself back into the safety of his tomb to reformulate his strategy. Thankfully, though, the veterans of the Death Watch were well prepared for any trickery at the hands of the ancient Necrons. The strike team led by Lazarius had infiltrated their way deep into the command core of the tomb complex, where they had set up a vast array of melter bombs and fusion charges, all to be detonated in the event that the Necrons retreated back into their crypt homes. As the Undying finally rematerialized within his chamber, for but the briefest moment, he saw the blinking lights of the explosive charges before they detonated in a concentrated blast, finally putting an end to the Golden Lord who first brought Damnos to ruin. Returning to the world's surface, however, it seemed that an unleashed and untethered Catan was too much for both the forces of the Imperium and of the remaining Necrons to defend against. No amount of firepower was able to pierce its strange energy fields, with rockets and bolt rounds disintegrating as they came close to the ancient Star God. In return, the loathsome being reshaped and reformed the landscape to eliminate the petulant mortals which had dared to oppose it. The ground itself gaped open before crunching down to pulverize the squads of marines who had assembled too closely together. Energy blasts pulsated out from the Star God, reducing even more of the surviving forces to smears of acrid and singed paste. Nevertheless, the sons of Giliman were there on a fateful mission, and it was one which would not be denied by the presence of even an ancient god. Cato Sicarius, lost in the fury of melee combat, had personally slain a vast horde of bloodthirsty flayed ones. And yet, as he felled the last crimson beast, he found himself face to face with the transcendent Catan. Withered, and haggard from the long hours of battle, lesser men would have folded and fallen before the weight of horror before him, but that was not the cloth from which he was cut. Seeing this as a final opportunity for redeeming himself and avenging his fallen brothers, he unclipped the forbidden vortex grenade from his belt before activating the ancient artifact and hurling it directly at the heart of the archaic god. As the grenade flew through the air, its arcane inner workings hummed into life, spawning a nascent portal to the warp itself, which rapidly swelled into a swirling vortex, pulling on the surrounding strands of reality itself to be consumed by the immaterial hellscape. Sensing his actions, the Star God conjured up a fist of rock to crush Sicarius, but it was too little, and it was far too late. The vortex of unreality had latched onto the ancient being, and with but a dying scream, it ripped the star god into the warp, before quickly snuffing itself out of existence, forever banishing the bygone creature to the hellish realm of the warp, where it could never again return to plague our galaxy. Captain Kaito Sicarius arose from the muck and ice, staring up to see nothing but a twinkling and shimmering field of air above him. Where there had once been a transcendent shard of a god, 
was now replaced by the calm silence of snowfall. Standing once more, he surveyed the landscape, seeing that the bulk of the battlefield had been reclaimed by the surviving forces of the Imperium. Though the landscape had been scarred and torn asunder, it was no longer ruled over by the Necrons, and Sicarius was finally able to breathe, free from the torments of his past failings to this world. It is said that this was the first time that he managed to smile since Damnos first fell, and that it heralded a new time of greatness for the already illustrious and honoured captain. Kalgar once again reformed the forces of the Ultramarines and set about a plan to scour Damnos from any remaining Necrons who may have lurked within the deep crypts. Working closely with the veterans of the Death Watch, they delved into the tomb complexes, destroying every command node they could locate, utterly collapsing the bulk of the catacombs, ensuring that the Necrons could never again rise from its cavernous depths. This mission was only complicated by the arrival of an enormous Mechanicus exploratory fleet, which insisted that they should be able to first study and retrieve artifacts from the tomb before it was destroyed. Whilst they were permitted to recover some of the archaic relics, Kalgar was none too pleased to have dozens of tech priests busying themselves within what was still to be considered as an active war zone. Nevertheless, the forces of man had succeeded, and it was no longer the time for petty squabbles, so those of the Martian cult were generally left to their own esoteric devices. The chapter master, upon returning to his flagship, wrote up an extensive report of the events which had transpired upon Damnos. This contained the summation of his knowledge on the Necrons, including their strategies, their tactics, and of their weaknesses. This text was then distributed to the various masters of each Astartes chapter across the galaxy, with Kalgar hoping that this would enable the forces of the Imperium to never again be caught unawares by the Necron forces. As the time of war finally reached its true end, and as the last area of uncovered tomb was destroyed, Damnos was once again safely nestled within the iron bosom of the Imperium. The refugees, who had been rescued all those years back, were given the offer to return to their old home once more, and they readily agreed to restart the great geothermal plants and to restore the old order of mankind to Damnos. Governors and leaders were assigned from the most capable of the survivors, and the realm of Ultramar sent a constant stream of resources and labourers to aid them in rebuilding their shattered homes. Perhaps as something more important than the salvation of a single world, this victory once more cemented the name of the Ultramarines and of the Astartes as a force which could overcome any obstacle placed in their path. The meek men and women of the Imperium would no longer fear an enemy which could not be beaten, and the legendary tales of the sons of Gilliman would steel their hearts against the inevitable times of darkness. The High Lords of Terror, satisfied with the actions of Kalgar, decreed for there to be a brief time of celebration in honour of their successful mission. However, more important matters than trivial festivities soon occupied their minds, and the fallen souls of Damnos were once again relegated to the status of storied legend. This brings an end to our story of the Second Battle and liberation of Damnos. The hardy citizens went on to rebuild their old home back into a state of glorious prosperity, and yet nowhere is truly safe within our galaxy. With the onset of the era Indomitus, the forces of the Saracan dynasty have set their eyes upon the icy world, with the intent on once more recapturing it for the ancient Necron house. This war is still raging as we speak, and the war zone of Damnos is just as fierce and as bitter as any other apocalyptic battlescape of the galaxy. I will soon return, once a conclusive victor has made themselves known, 
where I will tell what I hope to be the conclusive end to the storied Tales of Damnos.